of any way I can honestly. <laughs> Hold on a sec. I don't know of any way I can introduce Chip. Chip is just uh, one of a kind. He's influenced me the past 20 years, completely changed my my view on how to take care of, of landscapes. Um, he's become a good friend and mentor. Um, and, you know, with that, I'm just going to turn it over to Chip and he's going to take everybody's questions. Chip, thank you. All right. Well, thanks, Barry. So what Barry and I came up with is I've done, you know, so many of the organic lawn care, you know, 101 type of thing, organic landscape management, you know, that. And so I thought that in my business, I've developed a, a a sort of an effort that I call ask chip and it just it take questions uh it's being built into my website and part of my online presence and I thought that you know just answering any variety of questions from practices to product to why we go about doing this the you know, the implementation approach, why a contractor should consider this as a money-making opportunity. So I thought we'd try that out in this format and, you know, be available to just answer, answer specific questions. Barry told me that he wanted me to start off with, you know, how, what got me to where, you know, where I am today. Why did I you know, decide to go in this direction. And, you know, some of you may know me and a little bit about my background. And, you know, I see folks I recognize and, uh, and, and know, and great to see you. And, but, you know, for me, I was totally conventionally trained. So I was in the greenhouse, nursery, landscape, industry, uh, retail florist at 22 when I was 22 and I was it was in 1973 1974 and everything all my training from cooperative extension and university was totally conventionally chemically oriented you know we were taught that you could not have a horticultural enterprise without relying on synthetic water soluble fertilizers and synthetic pesticides. So in those early years, you know, I was a licensed pesticide applicator, um, was doing that in a greenhouse environment. And I did that for 25 years until the mid 1990s when I just decided that for my own personal exposures, I'd had enough. I was beginning to learn things that were very concerning to me um, and decided that I would begin to explore alternative strategies. And it was 1997, 1998, that I shifted my horticultural specialty from ornamental horticulture as a greenhouse production and nursery, uh, nurseryman to a turf and the landscape. And I was moving out into the world uh, in 1997, I eliminated all synthetic pesticides from a greenhouse environment, which was unheard of at the time. Uh, I uh, Three or four years later, I got rid of all synthetic water-soluble fertilizers and fertilized my crops with uh, compost teas and fish emulsions at the time, fish hydrolysates, and, you know, began to and I was producing better plant material, more rugged plant material, not soft and lush, but, you know, something of real body to it. Um, you know, how did I, what, what was, when did the light bulb go off? Well, I, I did the pesticide thing for 25 years and for the last 25, it's been organic. So I've got 50 years now under my belt and, you know, products used to come on the market so fast. And when I stop and think when I was doing this in the early 70s, this stuff was only 25 years old. And they pretended that they knew everything. And then I began to understand the regulatory process and FIFRA, Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, Rodenticide Act, and all the flaws in that and risk versus benefit and how, you know, some of this stuff was evaluated. And I remember when I used to spray 
I, I hated it. It was the worst part of my job. And I never forget one day I decided I was going to make my life easier. So instead of having to mix every tank from scratch, I had plastic containers and I pre-measured my dose and put it on the container in my head house. And then when I went out and sprayed the first tank and when I came back, there was no more plastic container. <laughs> it was completely disintegrated. All there was was a puddle on, on the bench where it used to be. That combined with the fact that things came and went so fast because they were so highly carcinogenic or things that they never tested because that's not part of the testing process. In the testing process, they are, they're going for acute exposures that will kill a laboratory animal. There's nothing in the testing process that talks about low dose cumulative exposures over many years. So I began to understand that flaw. I had dogs in my greenhouse and my dogs died at eight years old, covered in tumors because they slept under the benches where all my stuff ran off. Now, granted, that was probably more concentrated than what you see in a backyard, but the concept is the same. What we know now with science and medicine is that things that the EPA said were problem at acute high doses are now more of a problem at low doses. So that's what science is. So all of that led me to say, okay, I want to try to find some other way to manage. So I took my extensive knowledge of horticultural systems and then overlaid organic principles on top of that. And I was fortunate from 2001 that I had 20 acres of athletic fields in my community to play with and do anything I wanted and trial and error. And I learned from my mistakes as much as I learned from my successes so that over time we were able to put strategies in place that were effective, that could meet a communicated expectation and produce you know, the desired results without the reliance on you know, heavy doses of synthetic pesticides. So I didn't just wake up one day and decide, hey, organic lawn care is a great thing to do, but there's a real reason that we do it. And when I look back now, the fact that pesticides have basically been around for 75 years, give or take, and all of the harm and damage that's been done by some of these materials, uh, that what's the future of the next 50 years if we don't begin to learn alternative strategies? So that was my driving factor. I mean, I, I have property I manage in Palm Beach and right there on the intercoastal waterway, big significant property. And, and the conventional turf guy down there said, well, down here in Florida, I asked him why he was putting six pounds of nitrogen, a thousand square feet on the lawn. <laughs> and now granted it's zoysia cut at three sixteenths of an inch, but you know what his answer to me was? Down here in Florida, because we have sandy soils, we put twice as much of everything as we need because we know we're going to lose half of it to leaching through the, the groundwater and it all ends up in the Everglades. So he's all anxious to learn, you know, alternative, you know, strategies, getting away from 100% water soluble synthetics. But, you know, that's kind of the thought process down there, sensitive ecosystem and put in twice as much. So all of that together sort of got to me do where I'm today and committed, you know, into the future to continue to develop and work with new product as it comes on the market. For me, organic or, or natural management or sustainable management, regenerative management, you know, whatever word we want to call it, transitional management, you know, it is organic lawn care, land management is a transition process, but it's not strictly product centric. It's I, I approach it as a systems based approach that involves soils and biological life in soils and the underground portion of the nitrogen cycle, along with uh, natural product input uh, as much as possible and uh, the, the bringing cultural practices right back to the forefront. So that is my way of managing as opposed to just four step program where I'm gonna open four bags at four different times of the year and put it down the way the manufacturer wanted me to, um, you know, and go from there. The last thing I'll say before I throw it out is that one of the things that's going to need to happen in the future, and this, I spend a lot of time talking with different groups. I'm working with 
30 or 35 cities and municipalities now simultaneously, much of it virtual, but is about meeting an expectation. And the expectation that we have in this country for the 100% monoculture of non-native species of grasses was developed by a chemical industry in the 1950s and 1960s to sell product. Because we all know that clover was part of all the grass seed mixes in the old days prior to the war because it fixes nitrogen. But then an industry told us it was a bad guy and you had to get rid of that clover. Now you lost nitrogen. Now they had a bag of soluble synthetic nitrogen, ammonium nitrate that used to be a bomb that they're happy to unload and sell us to get the nitrogen we just lost. So that expectation of the Better Homes and Gardens lawn is 100% weed-free monoculture is unrealistic. And it's a matter of changing, and, and we all are operating under an industry-developed you know, expectation from the 1950s to sell things. Not that industry and selling things is a bad thing, because it's not. I mean, that's business and all that. But the idea that moving forward is going to be trying to adopt better practices for human health and the environment and trying to, you know, work all of that in with a reasonable set of expectations. So with that, uh, Rachel, uh, or I'll stop there. However, you or Diana want to do the questions. Um, if there are any, we'll go for it. Not seeing any questions in the chat or raised hands yet. So if anyone has a question if you yeah so I, I have a question um you know over the years there has been some you know some some substantial growth in doing more sustainability uh practices in the landscape um which is good still have a long way to go but along with that there's also a lot of greenwashing you you know in in agriculture it's very strict in what they can call organic with the, you know, the organic um, material research institute. They set all these things in place. We have nothing like that. Well, we we have recommendations from NOFA and, and Rutgers and stuff as to what uh, would be an organic or sustainable program. But what I'm seeing, a lot of landscapers are making those claims that they're organic or this and that, and they really aren't. And you know, I've talked to the uh, the DEP in, in New Jersey about that, and they said they they, they really don't have any jurisdiction about um, those type of claims. It would have to go to the Consumer Affairs Department, and you know, there's really nothing going on. No, you're exactly right. There's there's all kinds of greenwashing, and anytime there's money to be made. You know, somebody's going to, you know, push the envelope to try to take advantage of that. Uh, you know, I'm working with a city now and they sent me, I, you know, and I get involved in the project and, and do my work and then submit my recommendations and report. I, I, I don't, you know, promote any one product, but I tell them to source what they can source and then send me a specimen label. And I got three specimen labels yesterday of it was the name of the fertilizer was O, uh, O, uh, O natural, <laughs> and it was all it was ammonium nitrate and urea and synthetic, and I had to say that this isn't even close to being compliant. One of the things that I've done is I have not duplicated the NOFA standards, but I've created a definition of organic land lawn and landscape care that I put in all of my reports and I outline and it's modeled after the National Organic Program and that for organic yeah. land care to be truly organic it has to be compliant to OMRI standards you know we can call it other things we can call it natural um you know and slide other things in there but if you really want to use the word organic it has to be you know it has to be and that's not to say that in situations you know I've had projects where there's certain things happen that have to be transitioned 
from heavy conventional management to organic management. And during that transition period, there may be something used that's not, you, you know, would not comply with arm recertification. So yeah. that that happens, and most of us understand that happens. It happens rarely, but it happens. So in that respect, I can't call that landscape organic because mm -hmm. it's it's in transition. So that becomes a transitional landscape with a goal of becoming organic. And the day we can call it completely organic is that day when everything complies to a set of standards. Um, Chip, this might be a good time before I go into these specific questions to do a, um, a recap of what are the organic standards where people can find them and some basics about that, um, where they're housed and so forth. And then we can get into the specific questions about organic land care. Does that sound good? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the organic standards for agriculture are housed at the USDA National Organic Program, and it's all completely spelled out. Um, for land care, uh, Barry's right. There is nowhere at this point in time that is the central clearance. I mean, I've done it as it relates to my work and defined it as it relates to my work, which I'm going to be moving in the future. Uh, you know, I, you know, I, I feel bad. I, I'm looking at Rick here and, you know, at the Organic Landscape Association and I've, I've kind of had to back burner that, but there's standards in there. There's definitions, there's guidelines. So you could go on to the OLA.org. Rick, I'm open to regenerate that. And it's just that I funded that all personally. And then I had to direct some funding back to my company for the last couple of three years. So I had to put that on hold. But in there, under the founding principles, there is a pretty strict definition of what an organic landscape should be. So you can go on to theola.org and you know you can see that that way. You know, one thing I do know is that I've had talks with um, you know, people that have seats on OTA, Organic Trade Association, and the OTA is the trade association for organic agriculture. And they're concerned about the landscape side, and they're they're going to attempt, I believe, to own the word organic as it relates to what we do in landscaping, because they want to protect the integrity of their product in agriculture, looking at the same thing when the word organic is used in personal care products. And it, it's not under regulation, just like right now, land care is not under regulation. So I've pushed back against the OTA and have a group in place ready to defend that what we have built and what we're doing in our neck of the woods here is basically none of your business. We'll take care of ourselves. We'll police ourselves. And we will work together as a group of practitioners to get this in place. And I know that's what Rick wants to do. And, you know, we've talked about that and we will get you know, we will get it done, at, you know, at some point, but that's where it stands from the regulatory perspective. Right. Hey guys, and, and, and hey guys, Chip, right. Just let me just let me know, Chip, you know where I'm at. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I'm not going to go without you on that one. We'll do that together. All right. Yeah. I, I just want to say Rick was also instrumental in, in getting um, um, Rutgers to do uh, uh, organic. <clears throat> Rick, you tell it better than I do. <laughs> The right. organic land care program. Yeah. I mean, um, well, yeah, I mean, that was part of well, Rutgers put it put together a working group to start an organic, sort of a, a NOFA-esque organic program um in New Jersey, which is to the best of my knowledge, is sort of been on hold since COVID. Uh they were trying yeah. to um make it asynchronous online. But I, I I'm not sure where that stands right now. I know they were still working on collecting some videos from some of the some of the presenters and and instructors and whatnot. But um, yeah, it's pretty dormant right now. Yeah. So you know, there's still I think there's still some information on the website um, that that may or may not be valuable. I'm not sure the people, the folks that are on here in New Jersey, you could find an organic contractor um, from that website if that was something that um, if there's any homeowners that might be interested in that, you can find a contractor that's been through that course. 
Um, but it, you know, it was good. You know, it, it had a lot of value to it. And I think that the information that came forth from that was good. Um, and I think it really, you know, it got the ball rolling with a lot of contractors in New Jersey to think about doing things organically, never, never to the level of NOFA. Um, but it was still a good thing for New Jersey to have to get people that were interested in that, that organic um, aspect to at least get their feet. Well said. Great. Um, Rachel, there's a bunch of questions in the, in the chat. If you, I'm looking at the good questions. If you want to yeah. go right from the top down. Yeah. Let's tackle let's, some of them. Let's tackle it straight away. Um, and, and just as a side note to my work with the NOSB, I would say if you can keep the OTA at bay, that is going to be a bet the best case scenario because the OTA in the food arena did not do, um, did not do the public service. They really decided to side with industry years ago when um, trying to defend organic standards in agriculture. So know that they they have a tendency to side with with industry. Well, the OTA has changed. It used to be a group of small organic farmers, and it's been taken over by the big commercial processors. And so the processors are the ones that are trying to sidestep a lot. We Make have, a, yeah, we have a Mary Scott who's asking about um, her community. Our community landscaper is doing volcano mulching around the trees and it looks odd, but what else does it do? It kills trees. <laughs> yeah, it, it's the fastest way to kill a tree. I mean, Rick, it's right up your alley. I'll say a couple things and chime in. Um, yeah. it, it basically, in a nutshell, what happens is, you know, when you plant a tree, you're supposed to, there's a, there's a flare, root flare, and you plant that just at grade. When you bring, and all the roots are supposed to come from that flare down, when you volcano mulch, you're trapping moisture around the stem, the trunk of the tree. It's softening, you know, the outer layer of the bark. It's getting softer. It's making that part of the tree think that it is now below ground and is supposed to send out a root. And so it produces adventitious roots that come out in a place where they're not supposed to. And then they tend to wrap around inside of that mulch dome. And they're at the surface, they dry out, they're susceptible to heat. And eventually a girdled tree will really struggle and then die. The other thing, insects, fungal disease, as that layer gets softer, ideal site for infection. Rick, you wanna chime in as a tree guy? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a, that sums it up pretty well. Um, I think, one one way to see if there's an indication of a, an immediate issue is to look at the tree canopy. And a lot of times when you have root collar issues or over mulching issues, one of the things you're going to see first is the center of that canopy is probably going to die back. Um, and you'll start to slowly see some dieback around around the rest of the canopy, but that's typically the way you see it go. Also, too, if you look around the base of the tree, a lot of times, like like Chip was mentioning, the girdling roots, we all go back to school and we can remember wrapping up uh, an elastic band around your finger and watching one end of your finger swell as the blood can't get through. So essentially, if you look at a tree and you see that swelling at the base of the tree, that's what's happening. <laughs> Is that girdling root, like Chip mentioned, it's it's really stopping the the nutrients, the water flow up and down the, the, the tree because just even though that bark looks pretty dense, the cambium layer, which is a layer that has the vascular system of the tree that pumps all the nutrients, water, et cetera, up and down through that tree. That's right outside that bark layer or inside that bark layer. So anytime you start to get some constricting on, whether it's either, you know, whether it's nylon twine, it was left on, or whether it was a girdling root, that issue starts to show itself at the base too. So you can see a little bulging at the base um, or more than likely you'll see the tree canopy um, start to thin out from the center on down. Not something you see from the from the bottom up. It's usually the center on down because as that as that root system dies back, the secondary roots are pushed out. What happens is, you know, the secondary root system is not enough to support the the whole canopy of the tree. Like like I mentioned, the nutrients are being restricted. So um, that's that's sort of what happens with that. And like I mentioned, the the, the first thing you're going to notice is a tree canopy center starting to dive back. But it's never good. Barry spot on, and so is Chip. Because the easiest way to kill a tree is to over mulch it. And 
really, I think that issue is over mulching, but the an either, either, even deeper underlying current is a lot of the trees and container plant material are taking from the nurseries already too deep. So when you're getting these trees from a landscape contractor and they're putting them in the ground, if they're if they're not taking the the at least the top of the cage off and taking the burlap off, next taking excess soil excess soil off the top of that root ball and exposing that flare before they put it in the ground, there you're already um, well I'm not going to say one foot in the grave, but it's you know you're already a, a step behind um, because you're planting that tree too deeply right right from jump right out of the nursery. So. Um, that's something that I encourage a lot of contractors to do is make sure that they, they do a cursory root collar excavation to make sure that they can find the proper depth of that tree so they're not planting it too deep to begin with. I think a proper tree planting webinar might be in our future, Barry. Um, I think there's, there's enough there just to do a whole webinar just on that. Um, Ryan, Ryan O'Rourke has the next question, and it's kind of a two-parter here, so bear with me for a moment. Could you give us a basic sense of the must-do list for someone trying to manage lawns following organic practices, second part? I know every lawn is different, but there are general must-do things, and what do you use as a pre- and post-emergent? So I guess the best way to start that is what organic lawn care is not is product based. So conventional management is product centric and that's the four step program and you know and like that they sell you four bags you put it down the way the manufacturer wants and you uh you know you may or may not have a cultural program in place depending on you, whether you use two, three or four of the bags, you'll meet a different expectation. <laughs> um, at, at, the, at the most basic level, lawn care is a systems-based approach, three concepts, soil biological life, uh, natural organic product and cultural practices. Soil biological life, and cultural practices in my mind are the most important. So if I have certain weeds in a lawn, I can probably chalk some of them up to compaction or lack of oxygen in the soil. Because when, it, and, and it doesn't have to be, we think of compaction like on a football field or a pathway or a heavily used public park, but compaction also can be created by a loss of soil structure. So soil structure is the way the sand, silt, and clay particles, along with the organic particles, are arranged. So you have these different aggregates. Aggregate is a piece of something, and they bind together, and they arrange into these aggregates. And then there's a combination that they come together. The basic principle that all soil particles, from the smallest to the largest, need to be surrounded on all sides by air containing oxygen to keep that soil aerobic, to support the microbial life, and to support the roots of the turf grass. And this is not usually addressed in conventional management because water-soluble synthetic fertilizers and chemical pesticides can override poor soil structure. So how, what do we do? Then now we focus on organic program. You know from day one, you want to take every step that you can to improve soil structure. So it should begin with a soil test. So you have an idea on what is what is going on, at least getting a an you know a, an idea of, of how the soil is together. One of the things that happens when you lose soil structure, you lose oxygen. When you lose oxygen, it goes anaerobic. When it goes anaerobic, bad organisms grow. Alcohols produce, it dissolves the root of the turf grass, all these underlying things. So that's where the systems-based approach comes in. We're going to try to understand the soil, know that you have to begin it with an equal focus on what is below the ground and what is above the ground. Conventional management is focused generally on what you can see. Organic management is equally focused on what you see and what you can't see. So if you don't have a healthy community of organisms working down there, then the grass isn't going to be that great. And you're going to have bare spots and you're going to struggle and you will get weed development. 
So that that's how you change your orientation of thinking to try to understand that everything I put in here as an input or cultural practice wants to go towards improving the health and quality of the soil for the longer term. And that's what regenerative management is, is really all about. When we look at the uh, pre and post emergent, um, you know, Barry has some of those that, you know, he sells. Um, the pre-emergent, my pre-emergent is, is good grass seed. Um, you know, I can show you pictures of a lawn that was 70% crabgrass. And two years later, it's 100% crabgrass free with no pre-emergent and no post-emergent. It was just cultural and working with soil and working with biological life and grass seed, grass seed, grass seed. I, I'm an advocate of overseeding heavily for the first two years. I don't think you have to go crazy every year. At some point, you're going to focus on growing the grass that you have established. Probably the most important thing. So grass seed is my pre-emergent. So um, I, I guess, it's important to understand that a grass plant, a lot of people don't think of this, but because a grass system, a lawn is a perennial, right? It comes back every year. An individual grass plant only lives for 12 to 18 months and it dies. So that lawn is totally dependent upon regeneration. That's the horizontal extension growing sideways. That should be the focus. I don't care about growing blades of grass. I do care about growing a root system, but I want all of my inputs and I want my biological life to stimulate that plant to continually reproduce left and right. And depending on which one of the cool season grasses you're growing, it'll happen in, in a different way based on their individual genetics. So that is the concept that you wanna keep in mind that a thick, dense, healthy turf will crowd out most broadleaf weeds and it absolutely will you know, be able to take care of crabgrass. Crabgrass, it's also important when you think of crabgrass, when you talk about pre-emergent, pre-emergent affects the root system of the grass. So when you're using a synthetic pre-emergent, the grass seed, the crabgrass seed is still germinating, but it is now, uh, as soon as that primary root comes out, the pre-emergent, the chemical kills that root. So that crabgrass seed dies as a germinated seedling. But you can't put any good grass seed in because it would work on grass seed too. So you've got a three month window before you can, you know, end up, so you get on this treadmill of pre-emergent every year, and but you can never thicken the system in the spring, where if I go out in the spring with a fairly quickly germinating seed, I can fill bare spots before crabgrass gets to be an issue. Now, will I see possibly some breakthrough uh, in my first year? Possibly, depending upon how heavy the crabgrass pressure was. Um, but uh, if, if I don't, and if I'm on the if I'm on the chemical treadmill, I'm never going to really gain on it. Post-emergent, a uh, selective post-emergent. Um, you know, Barry and I have been through the you know, the, the, the saga over the years with Fiesta and, you know, the way I use Fiesta now, I'm, I'm happy. It gives me what I need. Um, it, you know, the labeled rate, as the, the labeled rate went from five ounces to a gallon to seven to nine. And now it's, you know, EPA has pushed it up to 12. Um, absolutely, it is effective. It may need a couple of applications. It's not 100% organic. That's a transitional prod, prod, product. Uh, I don't automatically schedule it into my program every year. I use it in the transitional times. Um, I call it 90% organic because the iron is organic. It's just that the chelator, H-E-D-T-A, is a synthetic compound. So there is a synthetic, but that's the same as corn gluten. Corn gluten is not organic. Corn gluten wouldn't be corn gluten unless those kernels of corn were soaked in sulfur dioxide to form a mush and then pressed out 
go through the wet milling process and come out with 28 different byproducts of the corn plant and gluten is one of them. So Fiesta is, I look at it that way, that it is a natural material that is made effective by synthetic intervention. And I have, a, a, you know, broadleaf plantain, dandelions, if I, if, if the goal, I'm not the guy that's always going to brand clover as a bad guy, but if the mandate is to get it out of there, you know, I can get it out of there. Um, and it's it's been successful. I've got my own little recipes of it that work. And, um, you know, I don't think in an organic lawn transition, you need to go beyond that. Fantastic. Well said. Um, Susan has a similar question. Um or along the same lines. And I think we've got quite a few in the chat that are on this topic. But Susan um, Lorielli would like to know um, what time frame are we taking a lawn uh, that's used heavily uh, heavy chemicals to switching to all organics? Um, the time frame that the lawn will start to respond positively to organics. We are going into year three and it's still um, rough as far as getting people to believe it will get better. Um, it really is about the way you're approaching the combination of product input and cultural practices and stimulating soil biological life. So in my work, I, I spend tens of thousands of dollars a year testing soils. And I've tested soils biologically all over the United States. And I can tell you that most soils that have had chemicals involved generally have compromised biological life, that it's just not firing on all cylinders. So if you have, say, when we look at the soil biological test, we're looking at the total number of bacteria, fungi, protozoa that are there. And then we look at the active fraction that's working for us. So if I have a really low active bacterial fraction, organic fertilizer is not going to work very well. It just won't because, you know, where synthetic fertilizer is water soluble, organic fertilizer needs to be mineralized by bacteria. So bacteria break it down. The plant can't use organic nitrogen. It can only use inorganic and ammonium or nitrate. So bacteria interact with the organic fertilizer, they break it down, the nitrogen gets in their bodies, bacteria are a high, high nitrogen organism, higher level predator protozoa comes along, eats the bacteria, protozoa is a low nitrogen organism and ammonium is released. That's the nitrogen cycle underground. So if you don't have good active bacteria, organic fertilizer is not gonna work well. So in my transitional years, I'm looking at uh, including food for the biology. When I said address the soil and the plant, that means I'm going to go beyond just putting down fertilizer. I'm going to put things in there like a carbon source, whatever that may be, granular humate, liquid humic acid, a molasses. Something is a carbon source because carbon is food for the mi microbial population. So I you know, want to do that. I want to get the plant as healthy as possible. So the, the humate stimulates the bacteria. The bacteria gets more reactive. Now we can effectively break down the organic fertilizer, which in itself is also a food source for microbes. So we're trying in that first year of transition to get the biological population as healthy as possible. Depending on how good or bad it may be, the whole first year could be just balancing soils, getting the pH in the right place. Um, you know, I would I would assume that most people, if they were struggling with a lawn, would be doing a soil test. And if the pH is out of whack, then um, everything else isn't going to work as well because turf grass needs to be between 6.5 and 7. <laughs> It'll grow at 6.0, but that's the ideal range. So I look at a soil test and I check off everything and I just got to get this, 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 this in balance. I have to get more calcium than magnesium. I have to look at my exchange sites. I look at base saturation and cation exchange, make sure I can hold on to enough nutrients, get the soil piece in place, feed the biological life. Um, you know, time frame, um, 
you know, if, if you're if you're dealing with heavy chemical pressure in the past, chances are you're inheriting a system that has minimal weeds, but probably has a very challenging complex of, of, of life in the soil. If you're inheriting a property that's been chemical free, you're probably looking at a fairly good weed population and um, probably probably decent biological life. So those are the two ways that you begin transition. You know, weed free, chemical intensive in the past, some weeds to deal with, and you know, no chemicals in the past. Transition can be anywhere from a year and a half to three years, depending upon how much effort goes into balancing and adjusting the soils and soil chemistry and biological light in that first year. So Jeff, Rachel, can I, just, can I just mention something real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, so I think it's important with everything that Chip just said, it's important to understand that it may not be the or it may not be the quote unquote organic issue. It could be the practitioner issue. So I think what you probably should do is take a look at what that program is that that practitioner is actually putting down because if it's a quote unquote organic program, I've seen people claim to have an organic program with corn gluten and malorganite. And that's not going to do it. So I think you really need to look at the practitioner and see what the practitioner is doing. Are they doing an organic program like Chip is describing? Or are they taking shortcuts like I'm describing somebody putting corn gluten and malorganite down saying it's organic? So I think that's a, di a distinction that needs to be made um, moving forward. Address with your practitioner to see what they're doing to make sure that the, it is an organic program. Otherwise, you shouldn't be having after three years. You shouldn't, especially in areas that are full sun. You, sh you should not, if you're managing a system the way Chip is describing, you shouldn't have those issues that you're talking about after three years. I mean, you could, but unlikely. Unlike, yeah. And, you know, what we say now is the idea that, you know, it gets worse before it gets better. 20, 25 years ago, you know, we always heard that, you know, organic will work. It's going to get worse before it gets better. But when it gets better, it'll stay that way and it'll be really nice with the science, the technology, you know, the practical application strategies that have been developed by, you know, folks like Rick and others that understanding how this works. When I get involved in a project now, my goal is from day one that gets better all the time, that I never want to see a property fall backwards. It should never go backwards and I shouldn't have to wait until I'm satisfied. That being said, I'm not necessarily going to promise 100% monoculture. Weed threshold that I would think is appropriate for chemical-free management might be 5% weed pressure over an acre, and that's not very many weeds. And at 5% in an acre, if it's a 5,000 square foot lawn, a contractor can dig those out in probably the same price and labor as it would take for them to make a a chemical application. Chip, um, years ago, you did a, a, a study and in, in comparing costs and everything. And, and you know, when you when you start going organics, it, it is it can be very expensive. Um, but what your study showed was that over a few years, as things catch on, you, you're at, actually in the sending money, saving money because you're reducing irrigation needs and all the other inputs. And just you know, the soil biology is kicking in and taking care of the, the health of uh, the turf grass. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, we're looking now at you know getting documentation, you know, with some of the municipalities of you know at year for thirty five percent reduction in irrigation. Um, you know, as moving things, and that's that's due to enhancing and building soil structure. You know, holding more, you know, holding more water. Um, you, you know, that kind of a thing. And yeah, it absolutely. And we did this with, um, you know, I see one of the best guys I ever worked with in, in my life on the call here, John Soul, and worked with the National Park Service and at Hubert Her Herbert Hoover National Historic Site, we had a three-year pilot project. And at the end of year two, we were able to reduce product input by 30% and still maintain the same expectation into year three. So that was way back and we did it then. And we've only, you know, gone on from there. 
to be able to really be able to say that if we approach this correctly from the beginning and focus on the soil, and, and it really is, we can now predict or calculate how much nitrogen soil biological complex is going to give us. So if I want to manage a high-end turf grass system, I want five pounds of nitrogen, a thousand square feet a year. And a conventional industry is going to get that all from a bag. Well, we're going to do a budget and we're going to get so much from the soil, so much from recycling grass clippings, you know, so much if we add a humate and stimulate biological life and increase it from the biological complex. And then the balance that we need to apply as an input, you know, makes up the five. So, you know, that's the way, yes, Barry's exactly right that it, it cost will decline, you know, in time. And even in a municipality after we've been organic for four or five or six years, and all of a sudden, you know, municipal staff gets strapped and an application of fertilizer gets missed. It just slides right through because the system is built in there and able to tolerate it. It doesn't collapse because it missed a, a fertilizer application. I, I want to bring one thing up. Um, you know, Frank Rossi at Cornell is a, a turf expert up there, and he's a very conventional guy. Um, however, a couple months ago, he put out a uh, an article. I forget what the title was, but uh, growing turf grass without without the chemicals, no problem. And he he had this great article about doing all the cultural methods and concentrating on that, and you're going to end up with good results. Wow, that's fantastic. That kind of leads into our next question, which is um, by Gwen Martin. How do we begin to shift people's ideas about how to manage a lawn organically? I have a client who just can't believe a lush lawn is possible without the use of herbicides and pesticides, no matter what I suggest or tell him. Well, that's, yeah, that's a very common thing. So, you know, when I get somebody like that, I just, I did another, uh, I, I just did a Zoom a couple hours ago for a municipality, for a, a community group. And um, that one was pesticide 101. And the reality of, you know, it, it basically is that person needs to be educated on what a pesticide is and what some of these synthetics will do. And the difference between an active ingredient and an inert ingredient. And the bottom line is all these chemicals that are going down on a lawn we don't even know what's in the bag, box, or bottle. You only know what the active ingredient is. And the active ingredient is usually two, three, five, maybe 10% of what's in the container. The other 90% is trade secret. We don't know what it is. And it's probably more toxic than the active ingredient. So that the, rea the reality that some of these lawn care herbicides, you know, Trimex, Speed Zone, three, three products in one bottle, no one has ever tested, taken that bottle and poured it out, except for some research independent scientists, medical scientists, but it all that's tested is the pure active ingredient of each of those three. So there are those people that think that it's no big deal because they go into Home Depot and Lowe's and they see pallets of the stuff and kids can walk along and touch it. It's right there. How bad can it be? It's so pervasive. It's everywhere. Can it really be that bad? So it's education. It's what I call an awareness through education <laughs> and then seeing is believing. So, you know, that that's why I have, like when I do some of mine, I don't work directly with retail customers. I, I, I manage like four or five really large estate properties and develop organic programs for the entire landscape. But you know, I mean, I it, it's I have one one guy that uh, uh, he's just got he's just everything has to be pristine. His wife wanted organic because she has health issues. He didn't care. He wanted to just nuke the whole place, and he always did nuke the whole place. But he said, "Okay, sounds like my a divorce wife wants it. Go ahead and do it." He is so happy. He's he, he loves it. He absolutely. She's happy. He's happy. The expectations were met. I mean, we're talking in a state with 55,000 square feet of, of Kentucky bluegrass, as crazy as that sounds. But 
the idea that it can be done. And, and so it's, it's the awareness to education and then the seeing is believing thing. Yeah, uh, Chip, I'll just bring this up. Um, EPA minimum risk pesticides uh, are not organic, but they are required to list the inert ingredients. Yeah, some, yeah, some, some of them do. Yeah, 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 because there's, there's different, there's different classes of inerts. There's inerts of toxicological concern, inerts that can go into organic and then inerts that can go into minimum risk. So there's three different groups of inert ingredients. So I'm talking about the ones that are considered that are generally used in speed zone trimec and all that as the inert ingredients of toxicological concern. I have a question to piggyback on that um, personally. What, what does the chemical pesticide feedback loop tell us over time? What do we see over time if we don't go organic? What can we expect? Well, well you know, um, a pesticide is not the friendliest thing for plant material, right? So if you're injecting plant material with systemics, because, you know, we, instead of spraying, which is probably a more desirable way to do it, think about it. You have all this chemical moving in and up and down and in through the plant. So it's not a natural part of the plant. So long term, I mean, there was a study done a number of years ago on Kentucky bluegrass, monoculture, a three year study, and it was managed conventionally. So pesticides and synthetic salt based soluble fertilizers. At the end of the three years, the system had deteriorated in quality because it, it, it the harshness of all these salts, synthetic fertilizer is just, I mean, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are mineral salts that have become, that, that are soluble and quickly get into the plant. Now with synthetics, you can have slow release. There's ways to slow it down. But the bottom line is that Kentucky bluegrass system, after three years, it wasn't that great anymore because the focus was on that. So unless you had the cultural practices, unless you had the grass seed because you had degraded the soil system and you couldn't have a happy, healthy plant. So in the long term, you know, it's about, it's, it's even like high profile sports and all the rest of it. That grass is under so much stress a lot of it because it's cut short and a lot of it because all the stuff that's being pounded to it. And it's, it's not a happy environment. It's a very stressful environment for the plant. The next question we have is regarding um, removing lawn um, without the use of chemicals. And it's by uh, Marie. And she says, I do strictly organic work with clients and asking me to reduce their lawn reduce their lawn or switch to eco lawns aside from sheet mulching and ram board and mulch, uh, particularly for large areas, what are the best methods for removing lawn without the use of chemicals? Well, you, you mentioned, you know, those and they are all absolutely, you know, legitimate. Um, I know it, it's not what people want to hear when you have large areas, but mechanical removal with a sod cutter, you know, is the best way. I mean, it, it's, you know, because the others, you know, the sheet mulching and, and um, you know, the cardboard, the solarization strategies and things like that take time. So if you're looking to do something in the short term, you know, you have two options. You're going to put Roundup on it or you're going to mechanically remove it. And then depending on what grass is being grown, if it's Kentucky bluegrass, Remember that it has underground reproductive stems called rhizomes. And if you don't get the rhizomes out of there, then the bluegrass is going to continually pop back up again. So when you, I'm assuming that you're, you know, looking to, you know, reduce the lawn and, and have other plant material there, which I did. I had a client with 85,000 square feet of grass and she would never get rid of any. And I kept telling her, Linda, get rid of some grass. You don't need it. And she wouldn't. So she only walked it twice a year with me, never went out there. <laughs> and so one day I went out and I ripped out 10,000 square feet of her lawn. I never asked her, never told her. And then I replanted it, brought the woods closer to the house. And then I went the next 
month I took out another 5,000 square feet and we walked it. And she said, what's different out here? And I said, well, you have 15,000 square feet of grass less than you had before. She loved it. Now she thought it was her idea. Do more, get rid of some more. And I said, well, you know, that lawn's the biggest expense you have out here. And then that even convinced it even more. But yeah, so it's whether you're looking to reestablish like an eco lawn. I mean, I'm talking with folks in Manhattan, right downtown Manhattan, right on 8th Avenue, where they're going to sow clover and pollinator friendly plants into their front lawn because they want to be more environmentally friendly. So, when, you know, the strategy was, do I rip out everything that's there and start from scratch? Or do I just bring an eco lawn into the existing lawn and develop it like that? I mean, depending on individual situations, that could be a possibility too, is if you're looking for a pollinator friendly lawn, is you can work with what you have as a base and then bring your, your chosen species into it. We're headed into overtime here, so I'm going to uh, fast forward with a few of these questions rapid fire here. Kyle would like to know, would you ever recommend slit and or slice seed seeding in the spring as an overseeding method to get ahead of weed pressure with a thicker turf stand and also to repair winter damage? Ab absolutely. And, you know, you want one of the faster germinating seeds. Perennial ryegrass and tri rye is great in the spring because it germinates so quickly. But seed to soil contact is what determines success or failure with any kind of overseeding. So slit or any any type of mechanical seeding uh, is preferable to broadcast. But if broadcast is the only way that it could happen, uh, yeah, then that it but should be. But that's one of my number one strategies for the month of April. Vanessa would like to know what is the best compost combo for top dressing after aeration to encourage biological life in the soil profile? The best combination is a high quality compost. All compost is not created equal. You should ask your supplier for a test document to substantiate of, you know, what it is. It should have 1.5 to 1.9% nitrogen. It should have active biological life should be 40 odd percent organic matter. You would aerate, pop dress, and overseed, bang, 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 all at once, all as part of an operation together. Fantastic. Um, we Susan would like to know, in her municipality, they have a pesticide herbicide ordinance in place. So um, there is a loophole for disease carrying insects. So we see a lot of broad application of both organic and synthetic tick and mosquito sprays. How do you educate folks about the risks of these products, including the risk of wiping out insect biodiversity, even when using organic products? Yeah, I mean that when you come to the, the safety issue, you know, that's when you begin to look at it. Um, you, you, you know, with some of the organic products, you can hurt, you know, beneficials, uh, not as much as synthetics, but the organic alternatives and, you know, Barry has them um, work just as well. You know, you don't have to have the synthetic insecticides, the common, you know, natural tick and mosquito controls, you know, formulations. Uh, generally have a, 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 a something that controls or will mitigate the pest and then something that will repel it. So it's a combination of repellent and a control product. And most every, for most landscape contractors, it's, it's an extremely profitable part of the business. The natural approach works, but we're not just fogging huge, big areas either. It's a more, is a targeted, directed spray on, on some type of a preset schedule during those months of the year. Yeah, I'll just uh, throw in a, a personal thing we experienced last year. A close friend of mine um, contracted West Nile disease from mosquito and it almost killed him. Uh, he's, it's, it's been a year, he's still not back to being himself. So um, I wanna say, you know, that a lot of these natural products do as, good a job as um as the uh the 
uh, chemical pesticides, but you know, do realize that they're they're really not all that specific. So they will they will also you know hurt a lot of beneficial insects. So you know, there's it's a balancing act. The next few questions um, revolve around compost and products. Um, Marley would like to know any downfall to lightly top dressing with compost every year. A uh, quarter cubic yard per 1,000 square feet, okay. Also, how many compost tea applications do you apply each season? Compost tea is best used in May and June and September. So you want to stay away from the heat of the summer, um, you know, when it gets, unless you're in a cool stretch in the summer. Uh, biological life is most receptive to those types of things in September and early October. Um, for compost, my top dressing rate is a half a cubic yard per thousand square feet. Um, you can go less than that. A little bit goes a long way. Uh, again, compost test is critical because I can put three piles of compost in front of us. One might be 18% organic matter. One could be 25 and it should be 40 to 45% organic matter. So if you buy compost for $20 a yard at 18% organic matter, but you have to pay $45 a yard for 45% organic matter, the more expensive compost is the better product. If you drop dress with compost and you can do it every year, you should try to source a non-manure based compost. You don't want manure as a feedstock because it's high in phosphorus, vegetative food waste, wood chips, leaves, that generally produces a compost. I work in the compost industry. I do testing for major composters. You, you want less than a half a percent of phosphorus in there because you're not trying to cumulatively build phosphorus. If you top dress with compost, you skip a fertilizer application because the nitrogen in compost should be such that there's a small percentage that is available in the short term, two or three weeks, but the majority, the biggest majority, 90 plus percent of that nitrogen is organic and will be broken down by microbes over the next eight to 10 months. So after making that application should take the place of a fertilizer application. Lewis would, would like to know, um, do you know the products whole organics and the combination of these two whole organics um, bio 800 plus lawn and plus the blue sky 2100. Yeah, that's all. I mean, organics was, I, I, I mean, I, I don't want to trash any product, but safe to say that 2100 is synthetic. There's nothing organic that's higher than 13%. And it's never used, that's a blending agent. It's never used as standalone. Organics got their name by taking some natural materials and infusing it with synthetic nitrogen. That's how they keep the cost down. So if you're looking to do a, you know, they've been around for a long time and that's how they made their mark in the thing. I've analyzed their product backwards and forward and they don't really have anything that would be uh, how we would describe being compatible with an organic program. I think you went on mute, Rachel. Yeah. We have a question from Nick. What are the optimal soil temperatures for soil tests for either chemical or biological, as well as optimal soil tests for seeding and feeding in springtime? Uh, well, it, it, it biological life begins to be active at 50 degrees, 50 to 55 degrees. Um, there's a whole school of thought now in the biological testing community that you can, as long as the soil's not frozen, they can warm it up in the laboratory and stimulate organisms back to activity. My general rule is that I, I, I use a soil thermometer. I'm putting one out tomorrow on the property. When soils get to be just under 50 degrees, that's the time to make the first fertilizer application because that's when the bacteria are going to start to come to the level of activity to facilitate the breakdown. 
for biological soil testing, I like to have my soil around 60 degrees. Then I know that I've got most of the activity functional and it's going to, you're going to show up on a, on a soil test, specific, especially the protozoa. Uh, if you're doing a soil food, test. soil chemistry doesn't matter. Soil chemistry, soil texture, really temperature doesn't influence the results on those tests. Fantastic. And uh, Mary would like you to talk more about dark dyed mulch. Yeah, that was when I was on a project last week and their mulch was reclaimed wood, meaning pallets and construction lumber ground up and then and then soaked in carbon black. And carbon black is a black dye that has its origins in petroleum and 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 mining and it is a known human carcinogen and they installed it with a mulch blower. So they just did this whole big property. They just put this all out. It's a respiratory irritant. There are organic dyes uh, and some companies do that. Most of the dye has at least some synthetic chemical component to it. So when you get the real blacks and the reds and like that, that's all dyed material, um, you know, depending on the source, uh, you know, I've had people that insist on black mulch and I will find out how they dye it. And then I go to the client and say, you really don't want this. So you really have to understand whether it is a vegetable based dye or whether, cause it's not, there's no real bark mulch anymore, right? They're not stripping bark like the old days and grinding it to a mulch. It's all wood, it's all ground wood, but different woods have different colors and then the aging. But what they wanna do now is just go grind it up fresh, bright white and then dye it so it can be used a week later as opposed to being ground and then putting in a pile to age to some reasonable color. Gotcha. Ryan would like to know, do you offer any courses that get into more specifics around the cultural practices that go into improving soil or turf quality, uh, compost tea, what the different fertilizers are, and when they're used, top dressing, overseeding, et cetera? Um, yeah, I, I did that, uh, I, you know, for quite a few years. I traveled around the country and offered a two-day course. 16 hours of classroom education on what this was all about. COVID stopped that. And then at my age, because I'm getting to be an old man now, it was, I, I can't be in too many places at once. So I'm in the process of just down to my last four months, five months of a four year effort to get 20 hours of organic lawn care education in an online course, which is gonna be a self-paced study with examinations and everything else. I was just building PowerPoints this afternoon. I've started recording um, and it's gonna have like 12, 13 sections with a specialty on sports turf and some other things. So I'm hoping that I'll have a couple modules out there for people to sample by later on this spring with the full course, hopefully online on the Osborne Organics website uh, by September. And, and Chip, I, I again want to thank you for the, oh, I don't know, three or four times you gave the two day course down here in New Jersey. Yeah, I did more with you than anybody else. That was, it was always great at full house almost every time. Yeah, thank you. Barry, it was, it was more than three or four. <laughs> it could have been. I mean, yeah. Mike, Mike Colnott told me that he'd seen Chip speak 11 times and I've seen him seven. So, you know, <laughs> it, he's like the Grateful Dead of Organics, you know, so we're just following him around. <laughs> it's been, it was more than three or four. There's no doubt. Okay. <laughs> Ryan was wondering if you would mind recapping uh, the three steps you just gave to in answer your slit seeding question. Uh, the, the three steps I gave on, on seeding operations, it would be aerating first, preferably with a core aerator, 
Um, you want to pull the plug, leave the plug right on the surface. Uh, you don't want solid tine or spike aerators unless you're working in a sand-based system. A shatter, shatter tine, like an aerovator that shatters is great, but it's aerate, top dress with a well-aged, high-quality compost, and then overseed. And the overseeding rate will depend upon what you are choosing for seed and the density or lack of density of the lawn that you're overseeding. So when you're choosing your seed, remember that perennial ryegrass has between 250 and 400,000 seeds in a pound and Kentucky bluegrass has 2 million. So a pound of bluegrass gives you a whole lot more seeds than a pound of ryegrass or a turf type tall fescue. So if I have a thin area that I really want to thicken up, I might go six or seven pounds a thousand if I'm doing a tri rye. If I'm going to do, and I would never do bluegrass in the spring because it takes three weeks to germinate and four more weeks to establish. So it's like seven weeks before you have something to cut. So if you're going to do a mixture of cool season grasses, some blue, some rye, some fescue, that should be reserved for late summer, early fall. Fantastic. And just a reminder, too, if you've got a, a complicated question or something you want to ask yourself, you're always welcome to raise your hand and we can, you can ask your question yourself by running your mouse over the reactions button on the bottom bar and selecting raise your hand. That's concluding our questions in the chat box today, guys. Okay, Chip, amazing, all kinds of great information and, and great questions from everybody. Uh, I appreciate all of you listening and, and, and contributing to this. Um, so I, I just, I have to leave with a uh, um, plea for you to visit our website. Yes, we sell products. <laughs> a lot of the ones which Chip has mentioned for. Um, and you know, just for being here, we, uh, you want to write this down because we have a coupon that will give you twenty-five dollars off of any purchase you make. So uh, it's a very simple password. It's just uh, when you when you go to the website and fill out an order, just put in the code, which is uh, Osborne twenty-five. It's that simple. You know, speaking of product, and not that you know, I'm not trying to be a product salesman, but I mentioned, you know, a couple of the product inputs, but you you still have the evolution line of grass seed, correct? Oh, yes. That I is that. something yeah. you should look at. That is, you know, Barry sent me a bag of it when it first came out and it, it, it was all that it was cracked up to be, uh, strong, durable, quick germination, good establishment. So, you know, don't not, think of him for things like the grass seeds too because that is a and that you can't get that everywhere that's you know and and so he's lucky to be able to have that and offer that but yeah the quality I of the grass that, that, seed makes yeah. all the difference in the world yeah uh, I, the, to me the evolution grass seed was like a game changer yeah no question where, where does that do well what what kind of places would you would you put that kind of grass seed? that can go any anywhere in the cool season region cool. right yeah it's a it's uh because it has a, a whole line of different grass seeds uh that will germinate quickly right away and then you have the other species that will come in later on and, and give you that it does not require a starter fertilizer um, it's endophytic so it resists a lot of um, diseases and insects uh, and, it, and it looks beautiful okay so again thank you everybody uh, visit our website uh, one of the things in there we, we give a uh, there's a whole program for um, spring and another one for fall, so you can you can see all the steps to take to ha to have a, a great. Um, I'm not going to say organic lawn, but uh, it's a great transition, and you can be organic too. But yep. So again, thank you very much. Next week we have 
Um, Tim Waller, who's um, a, a plant um, disease expert from Rutgers, and he'll be giving his talk then. Um, we have we have quite a few more lined up throughout the month of April, and we will still be adding speakers throughout the year. So if, if you have a speaker uh, that you think would be good, uh, please let me know with your contact information, and we'll see if we can get that person on. Barry, can you tell us how the recording of this video can be a, a, can be assessed by um, the participants? <laughs> Well, it's it's very easy as long as uh, either you or Diana record it and send it to us, <laughs> and that will be available on our website, techterraenvironmental.com. Um, sometimes there are glitches; doesn't happen. But uh, Rick McCoy's uh, talk the other week was is there, so you can watch that. And stay tuned for more. All right. Thanks, Barry. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Take care.